Thank you for being part of the Oakwood Free Will Baptist Church Ministries. Our prayer is that those who listen to the Word of God will find a greater revelation of God's purpose in their lives. For additional resources, please visit us on the web at www.oakwoodfwb.com. Today, may you be encouraged, strengthened, and refreshed by our message. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to be reading several verses, actually the whole chapter. Uh, well, yes, the whole chapter of chapter 5. Uh, as you're turning there, I want to say it is definitely so good to be back in the Lord's house with you folks. Um, one of the weeks that I was gone was obviously we were on vacation. Um, beginning on, well, let me back up a little bit. I was sharing with some folks earlier this morning that um, if any of you ever had migraine, raise your hand. Anybody ever had migraine here? Okay, you folks know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I don't know what happens when you have yours, but I'm fixing to explain to you uh, because somebody, you know, somebody told me one time, oh, that's a headache, get over it. I'm like, you have never had a migraine. So anyway, but um, in 26 years that Tina and I have known one another, uh, I have had two migraines in those 26 years until last Let's see, it would have been a week ago Thursday. So it was a week before this past Thursday. We were on vacation, and all of a sudden, something happened that I knew had happened before. I re recognized it. My fingers began to get numb. Once the fingers got numb, all of a sudden, I lost my peripheral vision, so I can only see straight out in front of me. I can't see to my side. And then this eye goes blind with little floaty things. So if I cover this eye up, I can't see it all out of this one. And then the bad stuff happens. Then the pain hits. And it feels like somebody's stabbing you in the eye is what it feels like. Um, and so it is very debilitating. You, I mean, I lay down. I cannot get up. Well, on Thursday during vacation, um, and by the way, Barry, I did not party. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a partier. Uh, just to clarify that. Um, so, you know, Thursday, I can't I think it was the afternoon sometime. I... Um, I get up and all of a sudden I feel it happening. I'm like, oh boy, I just got to lay down. So I had one on Thursday. I had one on Friday. I had one on Saturday. And then I thought Sunday morning, surely I'll be okay. I get up, raise up out of the bed and boom, it hits. It started the blurriness and all that. And I thought, oh my word. And so anyway, I had four in four days and before I had two in 26 years. So I am hopefully prayerfully thinking that I know what caused it and I'm hopefully not going to have any issues anymore with that. But uh, I will say this, be careful what you eat because it does make a difference. Um, so anyway, uh, but I appreciate your prayers for me. I did not have any this week, so I praise the Lord for that. I was able to work several days down at camp. Uh, and I was the director at camp, so it was good that I was able to be there. Uh, so, uh, and, and let me say something about camp. You would be proud of your kids. Um, I was able to mingle with them and to, to worship with them and to experience activities with them. And folks, they behave themselves unusually, not, not for them unusually, but they, when you consider all the kids that were there, there were 120 kids, my personal humble opinion, our kids outshined all of them. And I mean that, I, I'm telling you, they, they did so well. It surprised me how many kids complain about everything. I mean, it's too hot. I don't want to walk up the hill. I don't want to play dodgeball. I don't want to play kick. I mean, they complained about everything except for our kids. I'm not saying they did complain, but they didn't complain like the other kids did. And so, but you would have been so proud of them. I was so, so proud of our, our young folks. And uh, we've got some good young folks here at this church. And I'm very thankful for them. And I know you ought to be proud of your kids and your grandkids because they did awesome. Um, all right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The title of the message this morning is simply this, Wake Up Church. Wake Up Church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that, that this day should overtake you as a thief. 
You are children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. <coughs> Excuse me. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For that, excuse me, I don't know how old that is, but I had to have something down. All right. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but obtained salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another, even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow after that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come into your presence this morning recognizing that we need you today. Lord, as we look around us, as we see all the terrible things that are happening in our world, Lord, we recognize that we need a Savior. This world needs a Savior. And Father, I pray that those of us who have received the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ would ever recognize the importance of our going out into the highways and the hedges and compelling folks to come in, compelling people to know that same Jesus that we know. Lord, that's what our great commandment and our uh, great commission is all about on the screen. God, it's, it's about loving you with everything that's in us, and it's about going out into this world because we love you, because we love souls, and we share the gospel of Jesus with them. Lord, I pray that until you call us home, and that day may be soon, but until you call us home, God, may, may we be faithful, recognizing that it is our job, it's our responsibility that you have given us to reach this world for Christ. And God, I pray that somehow, some way, you would reach very deep into our souls. The Word of God would penetrate our hearts this morning and would help us to see that it's not just the pastor, it's not just the associate pastor, it's not just the deacons, it's not just the Sunday school teachers, it is every born-again child of God's or, or, uh, their job to get out and to win people to Jesus. Lord, I pray that whatever excuse we may be giving, that you would help us to put those excuses aside and to love people as you love them, to look at them as you look at them, as sheep having no shepherd and having compassion on them. God, I pray that you would help us to literally wake up out of our sleep this morning. Lord, that we would recognize your coming could be soon. And Lord, if it is, we need to be living our lives in a way that we will not be ashamed when you come. And so, God, I pray that you would challenge us from the Word of God this morning and change our hearts. Lord, help us to be not just a hearer, but to be a doer of the Word. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You know, folks, we are pretty good at talking a good talk. When I, as I mingle around Christian people, and I'm not talking about just folks from this church, but I'm talking about Christian people in this community and in the state of Tennessee and all the Christian people that I know, we are very good at talking a good talk. 
I mean, as a matter of fact, I can get up here and I can say exactly the things that you want to hear me say, and I can do, you know, say whatever and make you think, man, Brother Dwayne is just the best Christian in the world. I can talk a pretty good talk, but talk's not what it's all about, folks. It's about being. It's about doing what you know, living in a way that you know is pleasing to the Lord Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, we are given some, some pretty good examples in here of, of what we're to be like, considering the fact that Jesus could come any time. It's a warning to us. It's a warning for the church to wake up out of our sleep. I believe the message to the Thessalonian Christians and to us today, it's a wake-up call. And I know Paul uses the epistle to clear up a lot of things that relates, as it relates to end-time events, especially as it relates to where... Christian people have gone who've died in the Lord, and he, he talks about a lot of these issues and about what to expect and what's, what's going to happen or what is happening to those folks and to us in the end times. He clears up a lot of things. But when you read the last half of chapter 5, I really believe Paul is trying to get every believer to understand, to realize the urgency of the hour that Christ could come back at any time. By the way, he was looking for him in his day, right? And that's why a lot of times when you preach on something like this, people say, well, that's what preachers have preached about all throughout eternity. Is they're preach Jesus could come at any time. Jesus could come. He's going to come back in 88. He's going to come back in. You know, and they, they talk about a lot of things about that Christ is going to come back any time. Whatever, wherever you stand on your eschatology, the truth is Jesus is going to come back. Amen. He is going to take us to heaven. We don't know when that's going to be. It could be before the service is out. It could be a year from now, two years. Who knows? We don't know. But folks, the truth is the Bible gives us so many examples that we can know when it's pretty close. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, when you read the Word of God and you see the headlines of the news today, you know it's got to be pretty close. It's got to be. And I'm looking forward to the day when He comes and takes us to heaven. You know why? Because then I will be taken away from the very presence of sin. Amen. Folks, the power of sin is broken over us, right? Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But we still experience it on a day-to-day -day basis because we are still in the presence of sin. And folks, I'm looking forward to the day when we stand in His presence and we don't have to worry about temptation anymore. Amen. We don't have to worry about sickness anymore. All those things will be passed away. Looking forward to that day. But folks, we're not in heaven yet, right? We're not there yet. we still got a job to do while we're here. And we've got a life to live while we're here. We don't do like some folks and go up on a hillside, sell everything they have, and just wait and say, okay, we're not waiting, waiting for your return. There are folks that have done that in the past. But Jesus wants us to occupy till He comes. We're to be faithful doing that which He's called us to do until the day He calls us home, whether by death or by Him coming and receiving us Himself. We're to be faithful to Him. When you look at this passage, there are several things I believe that the Lord brings out um, as far as living every day as, as if the Lord could come back today. There are several principles, simple things that we're to practice, to put into practice in our lives that I believe will help us as it pertains to our walking with God until He comes to take us home. Number one, I think that our focus, according to verses 16 through 20, our focus ought to be on our dedication and our devotion to God. Now, I want to stop right there and say this. I am astounded at how many Christians will say, I love the Lord, I'm a follower of Christ, but you don't see them living their life in a dedicated way to the Lord. Everything else takes precedence over the things of God. And folks, it's very evident, not necessarily here, although sometimes it is a little evident, that things are more important than God is. I mean, I just, I don't know, a few weeks ago, I was looking over our um, directory. And as I looked through the directory, and I began to count folks, not just that, well, folks that are here on a regular basis. When I say regular, I mean two times a month. That's what most folks would consider regular two, three times a month, and I started counting. And I counted and I counted and I thought, there are 230 some people in our directory that are pretty faithful to church, but not everybody comes every Sunday. And I'm thinking if everybody would come every Sunday, we probably wouldn't have enough room for everybody, at least not as we exist right now. We would have to do some changing around. And folks, to be honest with you, that would be a good problem to have. Amen. It would. Amen. 
We need to be faithful, dedicated to our Lord and Savior. Part of dedication is not just your personal walk, but it is corporately worshiping together. Amen. It is worshiping the Lord together. You know, when I look out and I see empty pews, you know what it does? It's just like somebody sticks a dagger in my heart. Because I'm thinking, man, I want those folks here. I miss them. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. I miss them. Now, I know there are times there are vacations and there are sicknesses and so forth. But when you think about the fact that this place ought to be packed out, and it's not, it makes me wonder, where is our dedication today? Where is our consecration to God? Where is our faithfulness to God? And I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir this morning. I know I'm not trying to talk down to anybody this morning. I'm just simply saying, if everybody loved the Lord with everything that's in them, it shouldn't be a problem for folks to be at church on Sundays. Amen. Amen. It shouldn't. Um, and so somebody asked me one day, they said, or said to me, he said, well, Brother Wayne, you go to church because that's your job. I said, no, no. I said, God called me to this position, and so therefore I am trying to be faithful doing what God's called me to do. But just because I'm a preacher, if I were not a preacher, I would still be in church every Sunday. There was a time when I was growing up that I was not called of God to be a pastor, and I was at church every Sunday, faithful to the Lord. Number one, because mom and dad would probably knock me in the head if I did go to church, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, faithfulness, folks, we've got to learn what it means to be faithful to the house of God. Our devotion to God is important. Here's the question, number one, do we give Him all the praise that He, that he, he should have, that He deserves? Do we give Him all the praise? When something good happens in your life, do you praise Jesus for it? When something bad happens in your life, do you thank Jesus anyway? Do you praise Him anyway? These are things that are important as it pertains to our devotion to the Lord. When Paul said that we are to rejoice evermore, he is referring to the fact that we should be consumed with praising God no matter what happens in our lives. Praise Him in the good, praise Him in the bad still giving praise and honor to the Lord because He is worthy. Do we spend time in prayer with the Lord? Folks, your devotion to God, your dedication to God, will never be any stronger than your prayer, than your prayer time with Him, than your devotional time with Him. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but how many of you Every day, the first thing that comes to your mind when you get up in the morning is, man, I've got to spend time with the Lord. I've got to spend time with Him and His Word and praying to Him, allowing Him to communicate with me as I communicate with Him. There is nothing more precious in this life than that relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus. Folks, I love my wife and I love her dearly, but I love Jesus more. I do. And you know what? She loves Jesus more than she loves me. There ought to be a desire in your heart to spend time with Jesus. To spend time with Him in devotion. To spend time with Him in prayer. How's your prayer life? Do you have a prayer life? Do you simply pray to the Lord when something bad happens? And boom, you expect God to be there for you. When you have not been there giving honor and praise to Him. Verse 18 talks about that we are to give Him thanks. You know, we do a good job at talking when it comes to saying to God that we're thankful, but how do we show God that we're thankful? We live our lives every day as if today could be the day that He could come back. We live our lives faithful to Him, dedicated to Him, doing that which He's called us to do. I can tell you folks that I love you, and I do. There are some of you I don't even know, but I can promise you I love you because I love the Lord. And so... I can tell you I love you. But when the rubber meets the road and there's a need in your life and I don't step forward and try to do something to help you, then you're going to think, you know, you know, we're going to love me. So it's important that we put our feet into action. If we say we love Jesus, then we need to do what we're supposed to do for Him. Part of that has to do with giving Him thanks. It has to do with spending time with Him in prayer. It has to do, verse 19, Quench not the Spirit of God. You know, somebody asked me one time, Brother Wayne, how do you quench the Spirit? You see, the Spirit of God is constantly building a fire in your heart for God. 
constantly encouraging you to step out on faith, to step out of your comfort zone and do that, which maybe you're not too comfortable doing, but you're doing it because you love the Lord. And He's quenching that fire in you. He's beginning to build that fire in you to stoke those coals. And you're fire for the Lord. And when you say no to the Holy Spirit, what you're doing is you're pouring water over that fire that the Holy Spirit is trying to continue to produce in your life. And I wonder how many of us quench the Spirit on a daily basis. Oh God, there's no way I could do that. I'm, I, I'm not qualified. I'm not, no, I can't do that for you. And we begin to pour water over what the Spirit is trying to produce in our lives. You know what? I look around me and I see people that have got more potential than you will ever recognize of doing great things for God. But you know what? We stand in the way of that sometimes. We stand in the way of God doing in us and through us what He would have us to do. And we stand in the way. You know, we had some awesome ladies that did our VBS just a couple weeks ago. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know of anywhere that has any better VBS program than right here at this church. I don't. Especially for it to be a smaller church. I mean, we have got some awesome talent in this church. And we've got some awesome workers in this church. But you know what? God doesn't expect... 10 people or 20 people to do everything. God has given you talents and abilities. God has gifted you with things that He wants you to use for His kingdom and His glory. The question is, are you making yourself available or are you quenching the Spirit of God? I want to, I want to read uh, this uh, illustration that I found the other day and I want to read this to you. This is a village atheist. It says, the village atheist was not a bad man he just didn't believe. By the way, he was a very moral man. There are a lot of moral people in this world that do not believe. This village atheist was not a bad man. He just didn't believe. He was not interested in church, and there was only one in the area that he lived in. It was cold and dead. A social club, if you will, with no decisions being made for eternity. One day, the church building caught on fire, and the whole town ran to help extinguish the flames, including this village atheist. Someone hollered out, Hey, this is something new for you. For the first time, we've ever seen you running the church. He replied, This is the first time I've ever seen the church on fire. <laughs> that goes both ways, doesn't it? How many people do not want to come into a church because they don't see anything different in the church than in the world? They don't see a church that's on fire for God. They don't see people, individuals, and families that go out into the community and that live their life like they should for Jesus. They don't see anybody on fire for God. And so therefore, they don't want to come into the church. And folks, I'm going to tell you, if you want to see a community revived, you see the church get on fire and live the life they're supposed to live in front of folks. That will get a community on fire for Christ. That will get a church on fire. You know, there's nothing like seeing people sold out to Jesus and living for Jesus that revives a church. And I'm going to tell you, there are some of you have been saved for a long time. Some of you have been saved just recently. But I'm going to tell you, don't ever, ever let the fire go out in your life of serving Jesus. Don't ever let the excitement grow dim. Don't ever let anything deter you from being excited about loving the Lord and excited about serving Him. You know, it's very interesting when the Bible says that if you give a cup of cold water in His name, He will not forget it. Folks, that's a very simple task, isn't it? But if you give a cup of cold water to somebody, hey friend, I thought you were thirsty. Let me give this to you because I love the Lord. And we do it for His glory and His honor. Man, He's going to remember those things. Not that we do things that we do because, you know, we want to be rewarded. We do the things that we do. We live our life for Jesus because we love Him. And we want to please Him. And we want to give Him honor and glory. Not so people can look at us and say what a good person we are, but because we love Jesus. And we want all the honor and glory to go to Him. Do we quench the Spirit of God in our lives? The word quench literally means to put out the fire. I know in most cases putting out a fire is a good thing. But in the case of the Spirit, it's not. We are not to put out the fire the Spirit of God is trying to produce in us. But then when you look at verse 20, how do we really feel about the Word of God? How do we really feel about the Word? This phrase uh, means several things. 
Notice what it says in verse 20. I've got to flip over my page here. Verse 20. Despise not prophesying. Literally, you can insert the word preaching in there. Despise not preaching. Do you ever come to church and you think, man, I hope Brother Dwayne hurries up. Man, he's long-winded today. I, I try not to be long-winded, by the way. But man, it was dry as dust today. Kind of like Andy Griffin, you know. Sermon was dry as dust. By the way, remember what happened with Andy Griffith? He had to teach Sunday school. Pastor, because he said that about the pastor, he ended up, the pastor talked him into teaching Sunday school class because the man felt bad about <laughs> saying something bad about the preacher. Anyway, um, how do you feel about the Word of God? When you come to church, do you think to yourself, man, I get to hear the Word of God preached today. I get to hear the Word of God taught in Sunday school. By the way, that's a plug for Sunday school. If you're not in Sunday school, shame on you and shame on me. We need to get in Sunday school, okay? Um, hearing the Word of God. Do we despise the preaching of the Word? Do we get excited about the preaching of the Word? I don't know about you, but I do. Not because I'm the one preaching it. It wouldn't matter who's up here preaching. I love the preaching of the Word of God. I love to go on to our website where Tammy records all of our messages and hear Brother Eric preaching the other day. I love to hear the Word of God preached because I love the Lord. I love His Word. And I want to hear the Word of God. How do you feel about the Word? Is the Word of God important to you? Is it what you live your life by? Is it what you base your belief? Is it what you base your standards and your convictions on? But we need to focus on the right direction in our lives. What is your life? Look at verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. This has to do with our relationship to each other. We've been talking about our relationship to God. Now this has to do with our relationship to each other. That is, we are to uh, focus on what God would have us to do to others and to say to others. What does our life say to those of our brothers and sisters in Christ? What does our life say to those who do not know Christ? What should our life say? Number one, our life should be a life of compassion. People need to know how much you care before they care about what you have to say. That is simple truth. If you want to be an effective witness for Christ, then you've got to let people know how much you care by doing for them, by being the hands and feet of Jesus. So I think compassion is the one word we look at. But then number two, truthful. Folks, even though they may not say, I want to hear the truth, people need to hear the truth of the Word of God. But they need to hear it with uh, meekness and with fear. Speak the truth in love. But speak the truth to folks. If we're living our lives for Christ in a way that's pleasing to Him, not only will we be compassionate, we'll be truthful, but we will comfort those. Folks, we live in a hurting world. We live in a hurting world in the church, as a matter of fact. There are folks in this church that are hurting right now. What are we doing as brothers and sisters in Christ to help them? Are we encouraging them? Encouraging them in the Lord. But number, number four, I think of the word disciple. We are a discipler, if you will. You know, some are not as strong in the faith as you are. That's where you come in. Help them as they struggle in their faith. You be a discipler. You help lead them in the way that Christ would have them to go. We are to be a discipler. But also we are to be patient. As it relates to others, I think we're sometimes guilty of being impatient when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Many people we are impatient with because they're not where we think they need to be in their relationship with God. And we are very critical. And we're very pointed when we say something to them. And we discourage them rather than encouraging them in their faith. You know, it's one thing for me to come up to Keith and say, Keith, man, what is, what is going on with you? I mean, I saw what you did the other day. Why were you doing that? I mean, is that going to be a help to Keith? Uh, well, it may be. And Keith's going to take it the right way. But what I'm saying is, the average person, they're going to think, oh man, you know, yeah, there is something going on in my life. But that would be a discouragement to some folks. But you know what? What if I came up to Keith and I said, Man, Keith, I know you're struggling, man. And look, I love you in the Lord. And I want to be whatever help I can be to you. Can I pray with you about something? You see what I'm saying? I mean, you're, you're confronting someone. Hey, this is not the way you ought to live your life. 
but you're doing it in a right way. And I'm not doing it in a, a haughty way or a prideful way because I love my brother. And so therefore I'm concerned for him. And I want him to know how much I love him and care for him. And so you go in the right way. You speak the truth, but you speak it in love. You do the right thing in love. And so folks, it's important that we are patient with others. That we're loving to others. That we're encouraging. That we are a discipler. But also that we have this thing of forgiveness. You know, Keith may do something to upset me. Well, if he does, number one, the Bible says I'm to go to Keith, right? And to straighten that out. That's biblical. Not to go to A behind Keith's back and say, I can't believe what he said to me the other day. Let me tell you what he did to me. Folks, that's, that, that doesn't accomplish anything but cause division, okay? You do it the right way. You do it the biblical way. That is, go to your brother, go to your sister, and straighten it out between the two of you, okay? But we're to have this thing of forgiveness. By the way, the Bible says that if we will not forgive men their trespasses, God will not forgive us. So we've got to forgive. But then we need a life that is kept in check. That is, when we think about our lives, our plans, our goals, our ambitions, our desires, we compare them to the Word of God for clarity. How does our life line up when it's compared to the Word of God? You see, folks, if you compare your life to mine, you might fare out a whole lot better. But when you compare it to the Word of God, you see how far, how far short you fall and how far, far short I fall. So anytime you compare your life, you compare it to the Word of God. And I've got to hurry. The last thing I want to mention is this. What message does your life declare to others? I didn't say what you say to others. I didn't say you go to your work tomorrow and you say, man, I went to church today. It was so great. It was so good. I said, what does your life declare to others? I think it's interesting that Paul said at one point, I become all things to all men that I might win some. Paul went to where people were. He got to know where they were, got to know them, know about them, but he did it with a purpose. And the purpose was to lead them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you and I, we mingle with people all the time. At work, you know, at play, at wherever else you go. The grocery stores, the community, get-togethers, the ball field. Wherever you go, you are to be salt and you're to be light. Not just in the words you say, but the way you live your life. And it's so important, if you're going to invite somebody to church... Don't live your life inconsistent as a Christian. Live your life sold out for Jesus, on fire for Jesus, so that when you invite somebody to church or you want to tell them about Jesus, they're going to want to listen to you. Folks, it's so important how you live your life. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus could come back. The question is, how will he find us? You know, someone once said, a pastor once said, that how you stand right now with Jesus is probably the way you're going to stand when he comes to take you to heaven. So think about that. Your life right now, what you are doing or not doing right now, is it pleasing to Jesus? Are you living your life every day as if Jesus could come back tomorrow? If not, and there's some areas in your life that you need to straighten out this morning, may God help you and encourage you to do that. You know, we give an altar call every Sunday, and we usually have several folks that come and pray. But there are so many more of you that God speaks to your heart about things. And what do you do? You quench the Spirit. Oh, no, I can't come forward. That person may think bad about me if I come down here and pray. Here's the truth, folks. Who cares what anybody else thinks? I mean, who's the one that you really care about? It's the Lord. Don't worry about anybody else. By the way, everybody else is praying for you. I can tell you that. They're praying that God would change hearts and lives and would get folks on fire for Him. I know what these folks are thinking and praying. There's nobody in here that thinks anything other than, man, God spoke to their heart today. That's wonderful. And begin to pray for you. So if God spoke into your heart today, if you are living your life in a way that's inconsistent with the Scripture, inconsistent with what God would want, or maybe you are simply not doing what you know God wants you to do, whatever that may be, may God help you to come this morning. Let's all stand up our heads and close our eyes. No one's looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we're going to pray this morning. There may be one here to say, Brother Wayne, I do not know 100% sure 
that I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I am not convinced that if I were to die today or if Jesus were to come back, I would not make it to heaven. I'm not convinced I would make it to heaven. I'm concerned about my soul. Would you please pray for me? Would you slip up your hands and pray for me? All right, God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. One more question. Maybe you're here this morning. and Folks, be honest. God knows your heart. But you need to recognize that you're either where you are or you're not where you want to be with God. But maybe there's one here this morning who said, Brother Wayne, God's spoken to my heart from His Word today. I know that there's some inconsistencies in my life as a Christian. I may not love the Lord like I should. I may be putting things I shouldn't be before Him. Uh, I may not be the example and the witness I need to be. Whatever the need is, God has spoken to your heart. And you need me to pray for you this morning. If you slip up your hand, up and right back down, all we're building. God bless you. God bless you. And you, and you. God bless you. God bless you. Father, just now as we get ready to have this invitation, I pray that the Spirit of God would have His perfect will and way in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would not quench the Spirit, but Lord, that we would obey the Spirit. Lord, You've spoken to us this morning. There were a couple of hands that were raised that folks were unsure of their salvation. Lord, I pray that they would come today and settle it once and for all. For those who are struggling with things in their lives, they're either doing things they shouldn't or they're not doing what they should be for You. God, I pray that You would challenge them, change them today for Your glory and Your honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you need to pray at the altar, we'll pray with you. Talk down.